I was riding yesterday, and I said, hey, George, what do you say? You want to uh, jump in and have a, have a good discussion about your history, your career, and what it was like to be um, such an incredible professional athlete? And so um, George, George's background is extensive. As I said yesterday, he uh, has ridden the Tour de France 17 times, which is a record of professional riders. Um, he has won a number of individual races, including the US Pro Cycling Championship. He has won stages of the Tour de France. He has won uh, stages of the Perry roubaix race. Um, and he is best known for being the domestique, which is the lead rider for three Tour de France champions. Uh, Lance Armstrong, uh, uh, Cadell Evans, and uh, Alberto Contador. So, um, George, would you please come join me on stage? Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey. Thank you, Willie. So, first of all, thank you for allowing me to press you into action. Uh, I guess I would start with how does, a, how does a kid from Queens end up being one of the best pro cyclists ever? Queens, New York doesn't exactly seem to be a hotbed for, uh, for, for cycling talent. How'd you, how'd you get out? How'd you get into the sport? Yeah, it's definitely not an ideal place to grow up riding a bike, but my dad uh, grew up in Medellin, Colombia. Um, he was always a cycling fanatic and uh, basically forced me as a young child to ride with him every weekend. And, uh, Actually, New York City is quite the hotbed for different cultures, a lot of European influences and South American. So I would race in Central Park and Prospect Park every weekend growing up with people a lot older than me that have raced several races in Europe and had a lot of experience. And that was kind of my, uh, I just got pushed into learning how to race with these guys, which really helped me um, once I got to Europe, feel comfortable in that group. And as you were growing up, when, when did you know you were not good but great? What was, was there a race? Was there a moment when a coach said, you've got real talent? When is it that you all of a sudden say, hey, I got something here? So from like 9 to 14, I didn't lose a race. I won pretty much every race I entered. And then I, and then I flew out to Colorado Springs, or yeah, Colorado Springs for the national championships, junior national championships. First time I'd ever done a real mountain. First time I'd ever ridden at altitude. And I completely got crushed. So it was a big wake-up call for me to race in a different environment, but that was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great learning experience that, you know, I was very good racing in my East Coast area, but once I got to the national level, it was a whole different story. So it actually re-motivated re re me and made me push harder to, to, to get to the pro ranks. And was there someone uh, who sort of took you under their wing and said, I'm going to push you to the next level, if you will. I mean, we all think about sort of more, I won't say traditional sports, but I mean, if you're a really good basketball player in the US, you're going to get into the AAU ranks and you're going to be moved along and you're going to catch coaches and then you're going to be recruited into a college, et cetera, et cetera. In the cycling world, how, how does that happen and how did you get into the flow, if you will, to become one of the greats? So yeah, I was very fortunate that I had a great family support system. My dad was always my, my he was my first coach, my mentor. Then I got a coach in New York City, a coach by the name of Lenny Preheim, when I was 14 years old, who was very experienced in coaching and helped me get to the next level. But then I was picked up by the U.S. national team at an early age, 16 years old. They took me to Europe. As, as we all know, cycling is a very expensive sport. My family couldn't, couldn't afford to send me to Europe and do the biggest races. So being picked up by the U.S. national team and getting that support system early on was a, a huge factor in my, my development. And when did you first meet Lance Armstrong? At, uh, at the U.S. Olympic Training Center, I was 16 and he was 18 years old. And at that time, did you have any sense that he was going to be the rider that he became? Or at that time, you're sitting there going, I got this guy. It was kind of funny. I, I remember I tell this story a bunch when I go to uh, events like this. When we did our, the first race we did together was in Lime Rock, Colorado. And uh, he was a triathlete at the time, virtually no cycling experience. Um, he had built up a bit of a reputation. But for some reason, we hit it off early on, and we drove together to the race. And he had, he had a white IROC Z that later on that year got banned from the Olympic Training Center because he did burnouts everywhere. <laughs> um, 
But we pull up to the race and I go, Lance, what's our strategy? What are you going to do? He's like, what do you mean? And I go, well, we have to have a plan. We're starting a race. He's like, I'm just going to go from the gun and, and break away and win. And I go, this is, it's not triathlon. This is cycling. Like, it doesn't work that way. He goes, watch. And he, just, he did just that. He took off from the gun. We never saw him again. So that was the first race I ever rode with him. And at that point, did you, did you know that he had sort of something extra, if you will, um, versus the competition? I mean, was it that apparent that he, at that age, had just that extra gear, what I would assume people who played with Tiger Woods when he was at Stanford sort of said, hey, this guy's really got it. Absolutely. It was, his confidence and his arrogance was um, just more than I had ever seen in the sport, and, and he backed it up. He was just an incredibly strong rider, even at that, that age. Uh, his level was just, he was just much stronger and much mentally tougher than anybody I had ever came across up until then. And you're an incredibly humble person, so I'm assuming your personalities didn't exactly clash, but nonetheless, you're there trying to be the greatest cyclist you can be. How did you meld into that personality type to partner up the way that you, the two of you partnered up? Well, I don't, it's, it's funny. Um, we just did a podcast together this week for the Tour de France, a daily podcast, and every, every morning he had different sayings, like I was the yin to his yang, the startsky to his hutch, but... Even though we had completely opposite personalities, we, we really um, got along great, and I, and I felt like it helped us uh, perform better because I was always on the opposite side of the spectrum with him. Even throughout when we got to the Tour de France and we were racing against the best riders in the world, I was always that other voice in his mind, not always saying yes, yes, yes. I'd always be questioning some of the decisions he made and, and uh, helping with the, tactic, the tactical decisions. So describe for people what a domestique is. So a domestique is uh, somebody like myself in the Tour de France was, was uh, kind of Lance's, uh, I would shepherd him through the peloton. I'd always be in front of him in dangerous situations. Uh, the peloton is not, is not unlike this room, for instance. A, a picture several hundred people on a road that um, are always trying to position themselves in a, an efficient position, and they're riding on roads the size of this platform here. So obviously not everybody in this room can get onto this road this size, in the first positions, but I was very good at that, and I was very good at um, bringing my leader like Lance or Cadell or Condador into the first positions and really being able to call shots on the road. So I had several responsibilities, and of course they evolved as my career went on, um, and it became more important as well as I got more experience. And so th this room is filled with CEOs, it's filled with CFOs, it's filled with people who are in the lead position and people who are in the sport position. But in many situations, even if you are the CFO of an organization, you still are thinking, one day I'm going to be the CEO. I'm working to train for that. And in your world, when you got into that role, was there, what is it like to be in that just support role? That you know that you're in that role, but at the end of the day, you're going to get right to the finish line. And the plan is that he launches ahead. And you've been killing yourself for you know, six hours a day for 22 days straight, and every single time that you could go for that line, it's your job to basically pull over to the side and let him go ahead. How do you deal with that as a professional and, and, and not getting that glory, if you will, but then knowing that you're part of the team? So cycling is kind of unique in that sense, and, and I know that here in the U.S., the Tour de France is everything. People really enjoy watching the Tour. It's the biggest, it's one of the biggest sporting events in the world. But in cycling, we do 100 races a year, and in the spring, races like Paris-Roubaix and Tour of Flanders, which are some of the hardest one-day races in the world, I was the CEO in those races. And I was, always had the chance to win those races. I got second and third many times. Unfortunately, I never won, but I, was, I finished the top American ever in history in those races. So for me, it was quite fulfilling, and I knew that I was really good at those one-day races. And I was also one of the best in the world at helping others at the Tour de France. So I kind of knew my role. And... Uh, I was quite fulfilling to be part of a, a team uh, helping them win the biggest race in the world. For me, it was never a question of, I think I can get to the top of this mountain or, or win this time trial and, and be better than Lance. I knew I probably couldn't over three weeks just because of the type of rider I am and, and my attributes in cycling. Describe for everyone what it is like to be in the Tour de France and to win a stage. When you cross that finish line with your hands up in the air, what's... Uh, all of us have our own thoughts of, wow, that's my finish line. But you you literally and figuratively crossed the biggest finish line in the world up front. What's that? What'd you, what'd, I mean, first of all, it's been a dream your entire life. You cross it, you got your hands up in the air. But then 
how does it actualize itself with you? And then afterwards, what did it, how did it change you? Well, it's, it's, it's truly an incredible experience. Just, um, well, I've, I've had several ups and downs of the Tour de France, but once, once you cross the line in first, it um, helps you forget all those hard times and really all that hard work you'd put in your whole life. Cycling is, is all about sacrifices, being away from your family, um, you know, counting every calorie, uh, hurting yourself and training as much as possible. So once you cross that line in first, and then as soon as you cross the line, you're doing press, you're doing all this kind of media, you're getting messages from your friends all over the world. It's just, it's one of the most special days of, of my life. So let me switch for a moment to steroids and performance enhancing uh, drugs. And I guess the question would be, you were quoted when you came out and said that you'd use them, that you got to a point in your career where you looked at the competition level and realized that to be at the very top, you couldn't go without it. Um, just, you know, as, as you think back on that and the, A, the pressure to do it because your career depended upon it, um, how long was the sort of decision-making process leading up to saying, I've got to do this to stay up? And then once you got there, talk about living with the lie, if you will, living yeah. with the, I'm not doing it yet, I am doing it. Yeah. So my first year in Europe, I was 19 years old and there's, there's been drugs in sport has been part of every sport for 100 years now. Um, and in cycling, there was a, a year where there was a shift where it was kind of like low octane drugs to high octane. And I happen to be, in my, my early part of my career, part of that. So my first year as a pro, I, re, I moved to Como, Italy, and I was quite successful. I won two races in Europe. I won two races here in the US, which is a big deal as a 19-year-old kid. Second year, I trained harder. Um, I was more experienced. I did everything you can possibly do to be better. And I couldn't stay with the worst person in the peloton. Like, heavy guys that were in no shape would be riding past me laughing at me or, you know, making fun of the Americans for being so bad. And, and at a point, after a whole year of that, you just, you're, it's a small community. It's like, you start figuring out what's going on. And no matter how hard you trained at, at that point, now is a lot different. But at that point, no matter how hard you trained or how much you sacrificed your life, you weren't going to succeed unless you took that decision. So for me, it was, you know, I knew nothing else at the time. I was, I had only gone to a year of college. For me, in my state of mind at that point, I felt like I had no choice but to take, it felt like another training tool at that point because 90% of the people were doing it and there was no way to succeed without it. So my state of mind was not like I was cheating or I was lying. It was just like, I, I need to join this club or I'm, I'm gonna have to move back home and either go back to school or find a job. So I, I felt like I had no option at that point. Describe to people what the steroids do in the sense of, does it make you stronger or does it make you recover quicker? Because uh, just if you yeah. could. So the, the, what I was referencing to, reference to in the high octane was a drug called EPO. Um, and it just it helps you produce more red blood cells, which helps you recover quicker. And at that level, everybody is so good that we're talking, you know, two to three to five percent difference. It's not like, you know, you become this superstar overnight. It's just that little bit of difference where you can do that last hour of the race a little bit better, but that makes all the difference in the world. So if you don't, if, at that time, if you didn't have it, you weren't able to, to stay in the first 20, 30 guys of the bunch. And why do you think it is that someone like you, who is so successful, um, can come clean on this, and the world is quite accepting to it, yet in Lance's situation, Lance comes clean on it, and the world really has some significant disdain for the way that he worked through that? That's a great question. So. I was professional for 19 years and uh, turned pro. My first year pro was 94. Um, three years later or whatever it was, I, I got kind of started taking drugs. And then we got to a point in 2005, 2006, where there was a big scandal called Operation Puerto. And there was probably 200 athletes in that. Um, 30 of them were, were cyclists. The rest were soccer players, tennis players, uh, runners. But that never came out in the media. But anyway, it was a, it was a massive world story. And at that point, I had, be, had become, uh, I, I'd, I'd gotten to a really good place where I had seniority in the Peloton, I had a lot of respect, and I had a lot of influence. And I decided then, I was like, and I, I wrote a book about a lot of these experiences called The Loyal Lieutenant. I decided then that, you know what, I'm gonna stand up for change. So I, at 2006 on, I, I went around the whole Peloton, this whole room, for instance, and just started saying, you know what, I'm done, I think you should be done, let's all just, try to get rid of these drugs. So I really feel like I had a huge part in trying to change the sport from 2006. 
five years later, you know, the whole Lance Armstrong scandal came out about what happened 10 years before that. So for me, I had already, I felt like I had done my part and I was very open, although I never said it publicly, very open with my friends and family and anybody that was close to me that, hey, this was part of the sport, young riders, new up and coming young riders, that this is what it was like then, you don't need to do this anymore. Um, so for me personally, I felt like I had, although it wasn't open in the public, I had come out with everybody I knew and um, I, th I think that that support network, my support network, really got behind me when I actually came out and said, yes, I had doped. This is now 2012 when I came out. I had doped six, seven years before, and I was part of that culture, but I stood up for change. And, you know, I never, I was never the voice of cycling like Lance was, where he always denied, denied, denied. I never really got asked publicly in the media. I never had a billion dollar foundation behind me that, you know, that Lance was truly passionate about. and. Well, I'm not making excuses for his behavior back then, but he was he was the voice of cycling, and he he got asked more than anybody. Is there? Did the we just got done with the Tour de France? Mm -hmm. uh, 130 riders. Probably finished, yeah, but 180 start. About 180 start. Um, is anybody in that group clean? So I. I'm pretty confident that I can say 90% of the peloton is now clean, where 90% back then was not clean, 10% were clean. Now, due to my experience, I raced you know, with Cadell Evans in 2010, 2011, he won the Tour de France. Mark Cavendish, one of the best personalities in cycling, you know, I'd put my hand in the fire and say that he's 100% clean. And winning some of the biggest races in the world, Milan San Remo, stages of the Tour de France, where you know, in, the, in the 90s, early 2000s, that was not even a possibility. So I got to witness, I was one of the first riders to get on the so-called clean teams where we not only did the anti-doping testing from the government, the authorities like the US, USA, uh, USADA and UCI, we did our own independent testing. Um, so we went, really went above and beyond the, the testing protocols to prove that we were a clean team and we were still winning more than many other teams just because we focused on diet, nutrition, training. Nowadays, the big budget teams, they can almost mimic doping by, if you have the money and you have, you have the will to, to sacrifice being away from your family, you go to altitude 10 days a month, you have dietitians, you have trainers, your, your, your training is measured daily, they know exactly what you need to eat. So you can almost mimic now, the technology has gone so far that you can mimic doping by, by having all these other resources at your hand. So you can either join a professional cycling team and do that, or you can go live with Strauss Zelnick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, was there ever, as you all sat around and saw the world's eyes looking down on the cycling community with such a uh, sort of an x-ray view of this is a sport that has doping in it, was there ever the, hey, why aren't they looking at football? Why Absolutely. aren't they looking at basketball because you all saw it across, I mean, you'd go train at the Olympic Training Center and you see people there and you say that is it's, no different than well, what it's we're still, seeing. It's still very frustrating. I mean, if you look at, I think, uh, well, I'm a big fan of football. Um, Julian Edmond just tested positive and they didn't even really say what he, was, what he was tested positive for, but he got a four game suspension. Where in cycling you get minimum two, two to four years um, and it's a global media story where you kind of got to dig deep into the sports sections to read about it. Um, you know, you had a picture with A-Rod up here also. He, he tested positive two times. He's back in the sport. He's, although I'm a big fan, but it's just the, it's cycling is criticized a lot more. And I feel like actually cycling leads the way in the anti-doping movement. But for some reason, it, it um, gets the most criticizing for, for dope. So you've transitioned, and then I'm going to open up for some questions. Uh, you've transitioned very well from being a professional athlete into having a, if you will, a post-athletic career. Um, you have your, you have Domestique, which is your lodge down in uh, South Carolina, where people come to ride with you and ride with other pros. You have a uh, professional cycling team, which you are sponsoring and recruiting athletes into, and you have your line of clothing, Hincapi, which many, many people were wearing on our ride yesterday. Um, Talk to me for a moment as it relates to how difficult was the transition from being a professional athlete into being a uh, professional businessman. And quite honestly, your, your, you know, your universe, at least in the United States, of potentially one who've actually made that transition in. How many professional cyclists actually make enough money as a cyclist to be able to basically say, I'm done and I don't have to keep on working? 
Yeah, so very few make enough money to, to do that, to not continue to work. Uh, I was very lucky, and, and it goes back to my family support system. My brother and I started a clothing company way before I retired, and I felt like had I not had the clothing company and the cycling team that I'm still trying to build to focus on as a daily challenge, I would have been probably depressed, uh, honest, honestly speaking, because you're so used to having this one focus in life to be as the best cyclist you can be that once you stop, uh, I've seen many of my, my peers and my, my old ex-friends that they just get really lost and they don't know what to do. And it's like that in many sports. Um, but I was very lucky to have uh, something to jump right into and uh, focus on new challenges. And, and in many ways, you know, my life now is, is a lot more unpredictable and more challenging than when I was a cyclist. When, when you're a cyclist, if you eat right, you take care of yourself, you, you do all the training you can do, you can pretty much predict how good you can ride. In the business world, in my experience, it doesn't work that way. Um, so there's a lot more variables involved, and you know I'm learning every day, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to you know, know people like Willie where I can call upon once in a while and ask for advice. And, um, and I am for, I'm lucky that I had my cycling career to be able to meet people like in this room that uh, can help me adv advise me along the way. A lot of people who are pro athletes, once they've gotten out of it, say, I don't really feel like doing it anymore. Steffi Graf doesn't hit a tennis ball very much because she spent her entire career doing it and she doesn't need to hit a tennis ball anymore. Um, you were still an extremely accomplished cyclist. Was there ever a moment there where you were just sort of like, I just, I, I'm done with cycling and don't want to get back on it? Because you, of all former pros, have used your cycling to continue to push your business career forward. Um, was there ever that day where you were just like, I don't even want to think about sitting on that saddle again? No, it's actually when I was a professional cyclist, as soon as the season was over, I would take a month off the bike and try to totally recover. Since I've retired, the most I've taken off the bike is like five days. <laughs> and that was five years ago. It's, and it's just something that's ingrained in me. I'm, I feel like if I don't exercise at least five, six days a week, I don't feel healthy. So I feel like I have to do something. And I've recently gotten really into tennis as well, although I'm terrible at it. But I play tennis or bike pretty much every day of the week. And I feel like exercise, like Strauss said yesterday, is just a, a major important part of my life. And without it, um, I would struggle. So let me open it up for a couple questions. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, right here. Stu. Stu, hang on two seconds. S Susan's turning on the mic so we can hear it. You slide the thing up. <laughs> yep. So, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Thank and um, like when you won Gen Wavel Gum, I was so stoked. And this question, there's no value judgment in it. Like, I've done things at work that I'm not proud of and in my life and all that. My question is, like, when you won that climbing stage at the tour and you just said it was, like, the proudest moment of your life, was there some part of you that was like, oh, doping was a part of this? Oh, or were you just like, hey, I had to do that to get here. That was part of the game. I don't feel any regret, any guilt, any anything. At the time, no, because I knew that the people that I was racing with were on very similar or, or more advanced programs than I was. Um, we always kind of prided ourselves on that. We do just the minimum amount of doping and the maximum amount of training and planning uh, in terms of having the best team around us, the best uh, recon for the stages. And we felt like the doping was a small percentage of it where we knew a lot of other teams were doing the maximum amount of doping and the less of everything. So that's how I justified it now. Now looking back, I hate that I was part of that era, but I do know that I was a big part of the change as well. Um, I also am a big fan. Um, I remember watching the Tour de France several times um, and watching in climbing stages in particular, you give everything you had to getting um, Lance to the finish line. And one of the most inspirational things, being kind of a big guy myself, was Phil Liggett would say, George has given everything he has. There's nothing left for him to do but haul his large carcass to the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> and. I think to myself that often when I'm on a ride, too. So that's the first thing. The second thing, um, um, I'm having a really hard time reconciling Lance Armstrong's behavior to the public persona that he had and the continual, in essence, lying. And then um, 
and being in, a big fan. And then I see that he uh, got off with a $5 million fine over the postal suit. So do you think that um, Lance got a raw deal? Or do you think that um, uh, he deserves less or more than what he what happened to him? I think personally, he he was the scapegoat for all of cycling because he was the highest paid. He made the most money. He was the the loudest voice in cycling. But the hypocrisy involved in that whole process, where you know I had to testify in front of a grand jury and. Uh, talk about not only Lance, but many other riders, many other coaches and directors in the sport. But and when you look at what ended up happening was Lance got a lifetime ban, and some of the other people that the authorities knew were involved in doping, they didn't even get anything. Like, so if you see what, there was no real um, consistency in the penalties involved. Um, so what Lance was super aggressive in, in denying, he was also uh, got yeah, I think I've very um, penalized a lot more than anybody else. And if you if you actually listen to uh, his podcast now, I think you might get a, a bit more different opinion on him because his actually real self comes out where the way he acts around all of us instead of this kind of stoic personality when he does interviews in the media. And everything is out there now. He'll talk about anything and everything. He'll make fun of himself. He made fun of me over the last three weeks. We did it together. But he's actually quite an interesting personality and very intelligent as well. So I think if you take some time to listen to some of the tour podcasts, you might change your opinion uh, slightly. Anything else? George, I want to thank you very much. It was a great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. 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 Thanks.